Welcome to episode 32 of Rail Talk. John's got the props out already. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And uh, yeah, I'm still waiting for my Haiti shirt. And where in the world is John Green? Hey, Joe, John Green, general manager of DJ Stable. I thought since this is all the rage of hiding people's identities, um, although you blew it by saying my name, but be that as it may, um, you know, I'll the voice modulate this so I'll sound even deeper and sexier and even more like Andy Byer. All right, we're going to get to the racing that happened this weekend because this, there were some significant derby preps uh, to get to. Uh, but this was a bigger story for me, at least on Saturday at Gulfstream Park. And it was the breakdown and eventually the youth, euthanasia of a horse named Congruent who ran in the fourth race, uh, which was a pretty high class mile and an eighth synthetic race. Uh, he's this big gray horse coming off a long layoff. First time out for Safi Joseph kind of had that little uh, that New York Thunder work tab with he was just breezing like insane times went 45 and three last time out breezing on the palm meadows turf and he if you haven't even see the race like he was freaking out before the race like throwing his head around trying to run off dump the jockey uh and then once the race started he was completely uncontrollable and was just tugging and pulling right and left and you know fighting with the rider Edgar Zayas and then eventually about halfway through the race he stopped he pulled up almost backed up right in the face of another horse so that could have been even worse and then eventually they had to put down the horse on the track and I think, you know, it, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this situation the way we talked about Maple Leaf Mel and New York Thunder over the summer, like just because he was not as big of a name and didn't have as much attention on him as those two. His life was just as important. And it just seemed like one of those situations where the horse was crying out, telling people that he wasn't right, like before the race during the race so somebody missed something whether it was Safi entering the horse and i have my feelings about Safi joseph and or it was edgar zayas riding the horse clearly seeing that the horse was you know freaking out for one reason or another or the vet who's supposed to check the horse by the gate before he's allowed to run it seems to me like the system failed him and we just have to be so much better about this in general but especially in this climate and you know it's you know horses are going to break down it's going to happen you know we would love to have a breakdown rate of zero it's just it's not realistic we want to get it as close to zero as possible but the least we could do it seems is eliminate these kind of situations where the you know short of opening his mouth and speaking English and saying something's wrong with me. This was the closest that horse could communicate that something was wrong with him and nobody listened. And now he's dead. I hate to start the show on such a sour note like that, but that kind of ruined the day for me on Saturday at Gulfstream. John, what do you think? Well, and, and, and Joe, you're right. I mean, obviously it doesn't matter if the horse is, as you mentioned, if the horse is a maple leaf male or, uh, you know, or, or a meat and potatoes claimer. And, and don't forget this horse ran in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile as a two-year-old. Uh, won the Bataglia and was on the Derby campaign as a three-year-old and then had some time off, you know, w- went back to the turf, had some time off, and now was coming back, like you said, for the for the new training connections. He was a $350,000 two-year-old purchase, you know, tap it. So, again, it wasn't like this was a bush track and there weren't any protocols in place to try to, you know, make sure that the horse's safety was, was paramount to, to everybody. Um, but he gave us all the signals that somebody should have picked up on, whether it was the paddock judge or the veterinarians on the racetrack. Um, you know, and, and I can't blame the jockey. I really can't because from a humanistic standpoint, like Edgar Zayas is not going to scratch a Safi Joseph horse. You know, Safi Joseph's the leading trainer at, at Gulfstream. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying human nature is that he's going to give that horse every opportunity possible to try to run and work through, you know, whatever issues or kinks he was having. But that being said, you got to be smart when you're on the horse and the horse is throwing his head up in the air and basically giving you every cue, subtle or not, that he was not feeling good. So, you know, in the, whereas I can't blame Zayas for the pre-race and not, not, you know, not telling anybody or, or if he didn't feel it or maybe the horse had some adrenaline so he was kind of working through it. But definitely during the race, 
he had to have known something was going on because not only was the horse throwing his head in the air, but he was veering all over the place. He was trying to trying to figure out like which leg to get off of, um, depending on on you know on what the major issue was. Um, the one thing, Joe, that that I will um, take umbrage with is that a lot of people went online and said, "Ah, oh, see, the the Tapita track isn't bulletproof. It's not perfect, and it's like." It's like it's not the track. It's not the track that mm-hmm. made the horse break down. It's not because the horse stepped in a hole or because the horse, you know, had had a you know had a bad step on a perfectly good new Tapita racetrack. So that bullshit has to go out the window. It's that the horse himself wasn't sound at some point in time from the, from the time the horse got saddled until the time the horse got in the gate. Something happened, and it, it just was. A lot of people's fault that it was not picked up upon. And if it's not being picked up on on a feature race of the day, then when is it going to get picked up? Is it going to get picked up when there's a maiden 10 race in August? I don't think so. But, you know, the, the, I thought we had a good system in place. And maybe this is a one-off. I'm hoping it was a one-off. But there was just a lot of, of, of missed opportunities, I think, to help save this horse or at least make the horse not race that day. Yeah. Well, and like you said, I I totally agree with your point that people were trying to like use this as a dunk on synthetic tracks, which is just completely ridiculous. Like it's like you said, it's not as if he was traveling fine and took a bad step. And like he clearly had something wrong with him internally. If you watch the horse for two seconds and didn't just read about it, like obviously it was not the racetrack. That's not to say synthetic tracks are perfect, but the data is clear of the three surfaces. Synthetic tracks are the safest that we have. You know, and I think that there's that's a, that's another conversation I think that we could have is I think there's a lot of resistance to putting synthetic tracks back in because it was such a disaster the first time. And I think that, you know, some people think that they overuse it at Gulfstream as, as opposed to having turf races. They they cart a lot of races for the synthetic when it was kind of just supposed to be, you know, a couple of races and then a last resort if they took the races off the turf now. You look at those cards and it's just like four or five synth races and maybe one or two turf races a lot of times. So I think there is like that kind of push and pull about whether or not this should be completely taking over the product at Gulfstream. But yeah, it was, it's obvious like this is the, this is the safest surface that we have. You can argue over how much it should be used, but it definitely was not the track that caused this breakdown. And, you know, like you said, like the, the system failed him. And this is where there needs to be some kind of accountability. There needs to be a statement, I think, from somebody at first racing, from somebody at Gulfstream Park. Somebody needs to ask Safi Joseph some questions, Edgar Zayas some questions, because this is the kind of thing that you can't, you can't brush under the rug anymore in this era in particular. And it, like I said, there, there's, you know, Safi's got his issues. He had the horses mysteriously die last year at Churchill Downs and got suspended for it. Did we ever get to the bottom of that? I don't, I, I didn't see a, a clear answer about that, but this is where we're supposed to have some kind of powers that be and some kind of intervention from the track or from HISA or from somebody who has the power to get some answers here, because this is the kind of thing that should be completely unacceptable was obviously to me. I mean, I was, I wasn't on the ground. I didn't feel the horse, but to me from watching, it seemed very obviously avoidable. And now we have another dead horse to, to answer for. And it, it just seems like there, there needs to be a press conference or an investigation or an interview, something to get some answers about what happened and how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again? Like this to me is worse than the Maple Leaf Mel thing, because you could say that that was just a one-off freakish thing, ran too fast. Somebody, you know, it, it just happens. This was something I think sort of along the lines of the New York Thunder, but this was something that very, very obvious that the horse was in physical distress and trying to tell the people that are tasked with taking care of him that he shouldn't have raced that day. And it seemed nobody listened and it's unacceptable. Right. And, and Joe, let me just let me just put a bow on this with one other thing that we just were talking about. And that is the, you know, the overuse of the synthetic track versus the main track versus the, the turf course. I mean, a lot of our listeners know this, but it bears repeating every day in the condition book and in the overnight, there are 12 to 18 races that are put up for each day. And there are various, you know, distances, surfaces and allowance claiming, you know, the handicaps, et cetera. Basically, the, 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 the racing secretary or the racing office has to put together, they have to cobble together 
uh, you know, whatever races will go with the most horses in them. So right now, the way that a lot of people, a lot of trainers, a lot of owners are looking at this, they would actually prefer to have their horses run on synthetic for, uh, you know, for, for a host of reasons. One of which is that sometimes they just don't feel when the, when the horses are training in the morning that the track is in its best condition. I'm not just talking about, you know, Gulfstream, but, but there's a lot of the tracks that have multi-surfaces. And right now, the, the way the population is down there, more and more horses are leaning to, or more and more people, I should say, are leaning towards having their horses train and run on the synthetic because they feel like it's the safest, um, you know, surface for them to have. So I can't blame the racing office for carting all of these synthetic races if that's what the that's what their populace is entering in. If 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 they are you know if they are having the luxury of saying I'm going to choose a dirt race versus a poly race and I'm always choosing the poly race, that's one thing. But I know that majority of the racing offices don't have that luxury. They basically need whatever race has seven, eight, nine horses in it. And right now, with this current group of horses that are that are you know running at Gulfstream, it seems like that that the humans at least are saying we prefer the poly races. Rail Talk is sponsored by Taylor Made. A reminder: it's, de- deadlines will be here before you know it for the summer yearling sales. First one is May 1st, handy little countdown on the TaylorMade website, which is excellent, by the way. Even if you're not a customer, go check out the TaylorMade website. Beautifully, beautifully done. And it includes TaylorMade stallions. And, you know, not this time's book is full, as you would imagine. And as uh, Patty Wolf said, they're telling people not this time, if you're trying to breed to him at the moment. I promised her I'd use that joke. Uh, but otherwise, they have got a, a lot of really quality stallions uh, that are up for grabs. If you have mares and you're still making breeding plans for the 2020 24 season, Nick's Go, Tacitus, Instagram, early voting, Dr. Scheivel, Idol, uh, it's still Regard as well, and Rowayton. So we got a high quality, really good, and a lot of really good price points on the Taylor Made Stallions roster. Obviously, not this time as the star, but they got a lot of nice horses, a lot of horses from really good families, I think, that'll get you a good horse. And I, I, I got a sinking suspicion that a lot of those stud fees will go up. Taylor Made does a great job pricing them right to start their stallion careers as they did with not this time. And then once the success comes in, gradually raising the price. And I think that's what's going to happen with some of these. So get in now on those other stallions on the Taylor Made roster for 2024. We did have some really fascinating races over the weekend as we get, as we rev up into Derby season. We had the Gotham Stakes and the Fountain of Youth. Uh, we also had a prep at Turfway, but I won't make John angry like the Hulk by talking about a, a Kentucky Derby prep on the synthetic track at Turfway. So we'll just focus on the two dirt races. I mean, the Gotham was an absolute mess. Like we had to scratch Slider. Um, he had he had a little, came back with a little bit of a sore foot, but he'll be all right. But we had to scratch him Saturday from the Gotham, and pff, seemed like a blessing in disguise maybe for me because that track was an absolute mess. It was a monsoon all day. Kind of one of those cards. Maybe if there weren't a bunch of stakes races, they would have considered canceling. However, we had a very very impressive winner of the race in deterministic. You know, this was this was one of those one of those instances where. You could just look at the trainer and look at the past performances and think this horse could potentially be a superstar just by virtue of being in this race. Because Christophe Clement is not one of those guys who's going to run a horse off a layoff that that long in a big time stake race when he's eligible for a one other than allowance, unless the horse he thinks the horse is a big time animal and deterministic prove that he hadn't run since August. So there's basically a seven month layoff, never faced winners before. It just had the one seven for a long race back in August, fought through the slop, ran down some nice horses in the Gotham. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think he got a huge figure. It was like in the eighties or something. Do not care. Like that was just such an aggressive move. I thought uncharacteristically aggressive by Christoph that it just, it makes you sit up and take notice. And he ran to that. So I think this just being a springboard for him, He's got a lot more talent and a lot more big races coming to him if he can stay healthy. The other race was Dornock in the Fountain of Youth. And the Fountain of Youth became a total non-entity from when the entries opened and when the entry or when the PPs were posted and when the gates opened for the race. Obviously, you had the scratches morning of a Victory Avenue and locked two horses that were going to be two of the top four choices. And then Speakeasy dumps the jockey in the post parade, runs off, apparently gets a little bit of a scrape, and they scratch him. So they got it right in that case, theoretically. 
And then and we ended up with Doorknock as a one to nine favorite, complete cakewalk, absolute dream trip, easy, easy lead for him. He did not win as impressively as I thought he would, considering the competition. He had a horse who would run like buyers in the 60s, run second by only a couple of lengths to him, got an 88 buyer. To me, obviously a start, starting point as well for Danny Gargan, but that was not what I was expecting from him. I thought he'd blow that field away. The star of the weekend to me and the horse I want going forward towards the Derby season is deterministic. John, what did you think? You know, Joe, I had I had a very different uh, view on on the preps. I basically looked at him on Sunday, watched the replays again, knowing, you know, knowing who was going to win and what the situations were. And, and honestly, there was not I did not come away with any more answers than I did before that. I understand what you're saying about deterministic. And the fact that, you know, Clement could have opted like he's, he's like Shug, like an old school kind of trainer where he's going to take every opportunity to teach a horse something and to educate them. So for him to step up and put the horse in, uh, you know, in a in a derby prep race off of that huge layoff absolutely tells you everything he thinks about the horse. There's no question about it. But it was a sloppy track. And, and it's so hard to figure if horses, you know, didn't like the ter- didn't like the slop or we're getting mud in their face and just didn't want to run through it, or it was monsoon, like you mentioned. So I, I don't know, you know, really, if that race told me anything. Um, certainly, he's a nice horse. There's no question about his talent. But I need to see another one before I go ahead and, and you know, dub him, you know, one of the favorites going into the, into the gate in the Derby. And I think you can say that about basically every prep race. Um, you know, Dornock, the race scratched down, like you said, to a five-horse field. It was him and four long shots. Um, and, and as an aside, speak easy now, it, it's coming out that, that it, it, you know, he, he, he did what he did. Um, he apparently had multiple, multiple um, stitches going from one leg all the way up to his, his, his groin area. Um, and even though they haven't announced it yet, he's going to be out for like months and months and months. He, 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 it took a long time for them to do all the, the stitch work and everything like that. Um, you know, the rumor was that, that he almost became a gelding, uh, because he almost <laughs> locked his nuts off. That's, that's how, that's how severe it was. I don't know if that's true or not, but that, that's certainly a, you know, a, a rumor, but you know, Dornock did what he was supposed to do. I mean, he beat those horses. He kind of did it in the, in, you know, the right way. Um, Saez eased up on him. He ran in 88 and like Danny Gargan said before the race, this, he wasn't being cranked up for the fountain of youth. And, and I totally understand that. Um, my sneaky suspicion is that Dornock is going to show up again in the bluegrass because Danny Gargan is a Kentuckian. And for stallion prospects, um, no offense to the Florida Derby, but the bluegrass means a little bit more to the blue bloods in Kentucky. So I would not be surprised to see him show up in the bluegrass and then, and then go to the Kentucky Derby. Um, and then, you know, the, I, I know you were tongue in cheek about the, about the race at, at Turfway, but how can, how can you give any, credibility so far to a horse that's only run three times on the tapita um he did jump up and run 89 buyer he did win from you know from the 10 post um on a on an inside favoring racetrack um all meet that you know you want to be inside so i do give him props for that but again he's another one until you do it on the dirt i don't know what to make of that of that race and california it's like you know come on it's another four horse field um you know and 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 a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, Baffert team put in Nisos because they were trying to scare away everybody. Where the fuck are these three-year-old runners anyway in California? It's not like he scared anybody away. There aren't any three-year-olds that are running um, in those derby preps. So I, I'm not a big believer in that he put the horse in because he was trying to make it easier for his other entries. I, I don't believe that. But a five-horse field, four of which, you know, were, were, were long shots in Florida, you know, a tapita race, a turf way. A uh, slop fest in New York, and then you know a uh, four horse field in California. Joe, I did not come away with this weekend any smarter than I did going into it. I, I just I got to disagree on deterministic, and I, I just because I think the sloppy track, you know, you, you could say it hindered some other horses, but that was yet another variable thrown at him in addition to the layoff and the stretch out and the step up in class, and he handled it. Mm-hmm. You know, you could say other horses. Might have been, might have been hindered, but bottom line is he fought through it and he got the the dub and he got a ninety three buyer. So I think he's a serious, 
Yep. Yep. Serious, serious racehorse. You know, you mentioned the California races. We had a little bit of a scary situation with Scatify and the San Felipe. He got squeezed going into the first turn in that race. And it was, I thought he was going to go down for, down, yeah. for a millisecond. And thankfully, like he didn't, he didn't run a step after that, but you could kind of understand that young horse, only his third start, something like that happens. He kind of just freaks out and calls it a day. So hopefully he came back sound for anybody who saw the race and was wondering. So he came back sound and uh, hopefully we'll just be able to put a, draw a line through that and then point him to another Kentucky Derby prep in the actual race. You had the two Baffert horses dueling down the stretch, but do not care about that since neither of them are going to be eligible for the Derby. So pass on talking about that. But there is something that I, that I want to talk about, and it relates to the big cap card. Now, I didn't realize it was the big cap card until I looked in my ADW account on Sunday, and I was like, oh, shit, there's a grade one race at Santa Anita today? Right. And then I realized it was the big cap. shows you how far that race has fallen because it used to be appointment viewing in the late in the late winter, early spring. And it just it seems to me like you have to move that race. You just got to move it later in the season. I know that they have the, the old Hollywood Gold Cup that they don't want to compete with. But like one of these races has got to go the way of the Dodo. It just is a is a terrible product and it should not be a grade one race unless you can move it later in the calendar. And then maybe, maybe get some of those Dubai or Saudi horses to point there to springboard their summer campaign. Because right now it's just it's a completely irrelevant race. It was won by Newgate, so a big week weekend uh for Baffert. And the Kilroe Mile, Baffert won again. He's he's a he's got he could trade a turf horse now. Apparently he got du jour to win the Kilroe Mile. But just it, it underscores like how irrelevant that card is that none of these horses are household names or somebody that I think you're gonna have to deal with on Breeders' Cup Day in the Classic or the Turf or the Mile or any of those races. So that kind of leads me into, into the next subject where uh, it was announced last it was announced last Friday that First Racing is doing a new $25 million racing and incentive series, which connects the Preakness with, with the new race that they're trying to kind of align with the Pegasus called the California Crown. That used to be the Awesome Again Stakes, as well as the Pegasus World Cup. So those three races are going to be linked. Uh, the, the new series features more than 12 and a half million in elevated purses and seven and a half million in incentives for both dirt and turf runners. And there's a $5 million bonus. If the, if you have the, if you have a horse who sweeps the Preakness, the California crown and the Pegasus world cup, uh, turf horses will have a similar bonus. One, 2.5 million. If you can win the dinner party stakes, the California crown, John Henry turf, and the Pegasus World Cup Turf Invitational. Uh, also, they're going to bump up the the purse of the Preakness to two million dollars, which seems you know long overdue. Uh, they'll have three point three million in purses in, in overall on Preakness Day at Pimlico, which is now the the, the most lucrative day in the event's history. So the California Crown is going to be basically on on opening day at Santa Anita for the fall meet, what used to be the Oak Tree meet, um, s- September twenty eighth, and so they're basically they're, they're going to have a, a million dollar race there. They're going to have a $750,000 race for the Eddie D turf sprint and the John Henry turf. Um, and then obviously they're going to try to link that to the Pegasus card. I don't know, John, to me, this seems like this kind of money could be better spent elsewhere at Santa Anita. As like you're saying, the product has completely deteriorated bunch of four and five horse fields seems like incentives and, and bonuses for the regular overnight as opposed to just pumping more money into the races that Bob Baffert or some of the you know big dogs in California are almost always going to win, rich get richer type deal. Seems to me like the regular horsemen would prefer this to be in the overnight purse account, especially since it's overdrawn. Like the Santa Anita purse account is millions of dollars overdrawn. There's a it's it's a it's dire straits. It's like a very precarious situation right now for California racing and Santa Anita. Golden Gate's closing. Santa Anita is already on an island and. You, it's 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 tough to bet those cards. And I think it's probably getting tougher and tougher for a regular horseman to make ends meet at Santa Anita. So while I do like bonus series in general, I do like trying to link races together and get horses to show up more and more to big spots. It just seems like in this instance, you're kind of throwing money at the wrong thing if you're first racing. And Santa Anita's product, the day-to-day product, is struggling so much. Seems like a bit of a waste to me at least. 
Rail Talk is sponsored by The Green Group. Time is ticking away towards tax day, and The Green Group is the number one accounting firm in the horse business simply because no other CPA firm knows the horse industry like they do. Len's got over 200 horses. DJ Stables won over 2,500 races. They've got Green Group's got over 800 clients in the business because they make the money, save them taxes. And we got a special offer for listeners of Rail Talk. I know several people have already taken Len up on this. He's offering a complimentary, confidential half-hour consultation guaranteeing you'll get value. You call them up 732 634 5100. Do it before tax day. He'll prove to you that he can save you taxes unequivocally, guaranteeing, excuse me, that he'll find you value, value and savings. He'll donate to your favorite charity or whatever you want. He's not worried. He's always found value before. He knows he can do it with you. And like I said, time's ticking. We're a little over five weeks away from tax day. So definitely get involved. Take advantage of Len's offer. Go to greenco.com or call him up 732 634 5100. So we are beyond thrilled to welcome this next guest. He is the author of Exotic Betting and Betting on Myself. Uh, He worked at the Daily Racing Forum for a long time. He's one of the most sophisticated, smartest horse players I've ever known. And he's one of my personal heroes. Steve Christ, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. It's great to be on with you guys. We're so glad to have you. You know, I selfishly, I, I miss your writing, but I'm glad you're, you're, you're having a good time uh, in retirement. I, you know, you own some horses, too. We're going to get to that one horse in particular who did, had a lot of success last year. Uh, but I want to ask you mostly about horse player questions. Like I said, you're, you're you know, horse player emeritus as far as I'm concerned in this business. Um, you know, CAW wagering is a big big pressing concern, I think, for a lot of regular horse players. We've talked about it a little bit on this show. Uh, basically, algorithmic wagerers affecting pools later than you're able to see the odds and adjust your plays. I guess just my question is, is there a fix? Is there anything that we can do to negate their advantage and negate their impact in the pools? Because I do think it's driving a lot of people crazy. Uh, yeah, justifiably so. Uh, it, it's made the game a lot tougher. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm really of, of kind of two minds uh, about it. You know, on the one hand, my hat is off to anyone who can beat this game. And, you know, these guys have figured out a way that if they can get to, you know, 90 percent return on their money, uh, that then they get, you know, rebates that take them over 100% and and they can, you know, grind out a small profit on large volume. On the other hand, what you've effectively done with their accounting for as much as 30 or 40% of the pools, you know, at some major tracks, is that it's raised everyone else's effective rate of takeout from 20% to 30%. And that's going to drive people away. The only solution I see, I mean, you can't just tell these guys to take a hike because then your handle goes down 40 percent uh, next year and, and the industry's in a lot of trouble. The, the only, you know, quote unquote fix I see is what Naira has tried to do by just keeping them out of some pools. You know, basically the CAW players own the early pick five pool at Naira and they're not allowed to play, at least in theory the late pick five at Naira. So, you know, if you're a discriminating player uh, and, you know, you, it's important to you what the effective rate of takeout is, you know, at least you can choose a pool that the CAW guys are not in. And, and Steve, with, with regard to, you know, you having such a, a history of knowledge and, and, and I'm going to ask you an overview question of our industry. There are so many issues right now that, that have beset our, our industry from a decreasing pool of, of falls born every year to some racetracks going under to management to, you know, the horses being uh, or trainers going to jail for, you know, for allegedly drugging horses, not allegedly for drugging horses. Where do you see a problem that is fixable um, that will kind of set everything else in motion in, in the right direction? Well, I, I think there are a lot of good things going on uh, in in racing, you know, primarily in, in the area of safety. I mean, the the numbers we're starting to see about, you know, reduced breakdowns, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, caution and more vet exams and HISA and, and other things. Uh, it really looks like, you know, those, those numbers are, are starting to come down. And I think maybe, you know, the more that we trumpet that a little bit, 
uh, you know, the, the happier we can all feel about the future. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who believes in general that science and technology will save us. And, and I think we're heading in that direction in horse racing. So I'm, uh, I'm more positive than a lot of other people. Yeah, this is a question that that I you know it's it's probably unanswerable in terms of of uh, a specific data driven answer, but just anecdotally, I feel like since Heisa has come around, you've seen a lot less of these run off the screen, first off the claim, huge move ups. You know, it still does happen from time to time. I can think of two guys in general, in in, in particular in New York, who uh, went away for a while and came back and are still moving up some horses. But that's another topic for another day. Steve, where, how do you feel as a horse player? Do you feel like you're getting a fairer shake and are not having to handicap the trainers as much? Or do you still think we have a long way to go? No, I, I, I think that we've seen improvement in that area already. I mean, I'm not you know, going to talk about specific trainers, but, you know, people who I had trouble with in, in the past and their ability to, to move up horses in unnatural ways, I'm honestly seeing less of that. I mean, yeah, we have some really good training, you know, claiming trainers in New York. Uh, and I personally think, you know, Rick Dutrow and, and Linda Rice are terrific horsemen. You know, you can't say that any trainer who moves up horses off other people, you know, is doing something nefarious. Uh, but I, I'm not seeing from some less people who used to, you know, just send out horses to do kind of unbelievable things. I'm seeing a lot less of that these days. Right. And, and see, something else that we've been talking a lot about on the show, speaking of trainers, um, is the advent and development of super trainers, um, good or bad for the industry? Well, you know, it's it's kind of a fanciful point of debate. I mean, you're not going to change it. It's a model that works and it works for a lot of big owners uh, and large stables. So, uh, you know, it's 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 here to stay. I mean, yeah, would it be? better if we had more trainers and more trainers represented in big races. Yeah. But, you know, how, how are you going to make that happen? I, I mean, I think the genie's out of the bottle on that one. Yeah. You know, you wrote an interesting op-ed for the TDN last summer uh, called an Ar argument for dirt, which is a letter to that other by, by Steve Chris. You know, this is it. You kind of made the argument that Bob Baffert made back in the day that and I, I actually, you know, I, t I tend to agree with this, that synthetic makes good horses look mediocre and mediocre horses look good. It's like levels the playing field in, in I think, an inauthentic way. Uh, and it's not as much of a proving ground as dirt racing. On the other hand. Just on a on, on a pure number standpoint, synthetic tracks have proven to be the the bet, the safest in terms of preventing breakdowns. You made the point that it's not apples to apples, and that those those numbers include a lot of lower level dirt tracks where the dirt isn't maintained. You know, can you just expound on that? Do you do you honestly think that we can get to a point where dirt racing is as safe as synthetic in terms of preventing catastrophic breakdowns? I, I absolutely do believe that. And I think that's what we're starting to hear from from the track surface experts and Mick Peterson and, and those people, that there's no reason that dirt can't be as safe as any other surface. Uh, and I think we're moving in, in that direction and, and we're moving quickly. Uh, and I think, you know, for people to cite numbers, you know, really from 10 years ago and to compare brand new synthetic tracks you know, to dirt tracks where they haven't gone down to the base in 30 years. I just think it's it's a phony comparison. And I, I'm kind of alarmed and, and very disappointed that, you know, the idea of expanding synthetic racing in this country has come back. Uh, I, I think it's a, a bad form of racing. Uh, I don't think it, it brings out the best in our horses. I don't think it's good for the players. Uh, and, you know, we've lived through this already 10 or 15 years ago in the synthetic era. And there was a day, you know, where people were popping champagne corks when, you know, all the major tracks that had synthetics ripped them out, put dirt back in. Uh, and I don't know why we're talking about going back to synthetics. I, I mean, the minuscule difference in numbers that are already outdated uh, to me is is not a reason uh, to abandon dirt racing, which is the heart and soul of American racing. And, uh, you know, even when people talk about the bloodlines in Europe, well, you know, 
where did the talent come from? In many cases, it came from American dirt horses. Just want a quick follow up on, on that, because, you know, I, I'm of the same belief that I thought it was a disaster to replace dirt racing with synthetic tracks. And I think that that, you know, kind of worked its way out over time and, and the right uh, result came around. But I do think that there's a potential for the synthetic as a third surface. You know, Belmont's putting in a synthetic track so they can continue racing in the winter on a theoretically safer surface. Do you think there's any role for synthetics whatsoever not as a replacement for dirt racing, but as a third surface. Well, I, I think that, uh, yeah, for off the grass races, uh, for really inclement weather. I mean, uh, I understand why you race on, on a synthetic track in, in Toronto. Um, you know, and I think, I think, I hope that what they're thinking of it for in, in Belmont uh, is for, you know, off the grass races uh, in the spring and the fall, uh, and, you know, as a second surface in the winter, uh, I, don't, I think racing needs a third surface like a hole in the head. Uh, you, you start having divisions of synthetic against dirt and turf. <clears throat> you're going to have fewer opportunities. You're going to have more trouble filling the dirt in the grass races. I don't think we need it as anything except a backup for weather and off the turf. And that's actually, you know, Steve, it's interesting you say that because that's actually something that Joe and I were talking about earlier on in the show is the fact that, you know, these like Gulfstream is a perfect example. They went ahead and they, they um, you know, instituted the synthetic track with the minds, with the idea that if racing comes off the turf, it's going to go to synthetic. And what's happening now is that they can't get dirt races to go. They just don't have, you know, enough horses there that want to run on the dirt or, or, or you know, more preferring to run on the synthetic is, is that the trend you think is going to happen? Like at Belmont? I, I, you know, it's not exactly as if any jurisdiction has an overflow horse population these days. Uh, you know, and, uh, look, Naira does a good job of cobbling together cards with a a small population in the winter. But I, I really think if you offered a condition book with three types rather than two types of racing, these races would get even thinner, uh, you know, and you end up with with cards even on big days. Uh, I think Pegasus Day at Gulfstream, they only had four dirt races out of 13 or 14 races. And I, I don't think that's a good trend. Yep. Yeah, that's, I, I agreed. Like, I think that's that's the worry is that it slowly subsumes dirt racing and replaces it. Uh, you know, I was I was watching uh, the interview, such such as it was, with Mike Rapoli and Pat Cummings yesterday uh, on Jonathan Kinchin's show, and you know, they it took a long time to get to the point, as it usually does. Uh, but they one of the things they talked about was modernizing the wagering menu, which is uh, intriguing to me. You know, having wagers beyond just the things that we've had for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years, head to head wagering. Uh, you know, obviously fixed odds could be a big part of that. Is there any? Do you think that there's any merit to that that you could create more interest around like say you know i'm going to bet that this jockey finishes ahead of this jockey for the day or this trainer beats this trainer how have, have about like over under for how many wins a guy's going to have for the meet like the, just with with sports betting in particular and the the popularity of prop betting do you think there's any merit to having those kind of bets for racing I, I don't think it hurts, uh, but I, I don't think it's going to create, you know, a, a new fan base or, or drive uh, wagering in any meaningful way. But, you know, fine. The, I mean, the, the more the merrier. Gotcha. All right. All right. Well, since, since you mentioned over under and prop bets, Steve, I know you're a big San Francisco Giants fan. So I just saw that Vegas put out the over under and Giants are at 82 wins. Are you taking the over or the under? Because it's a pretty competitive uh, NL West there this year. It's a, it's a tough division, but I, I like the moves we've made. A couple of good signings in the, the last two weeks. Um, you know, I, I would never put myself in a position to root against my team. Uh, so, you know, I'd, I'd always take the over, whatever the prop is with the Giants. Uh, but I, I think 82 is a, about a fair number. 
Yeah, I, I never bet against my teams, even though I should a lot of times in the Jets case. Uh, last question from me. Uh, so you've had a you, you've had a nice run um, with Thin White Duke, who you know is a is a really nice turf sprinter, multiple stakes winner. Uh, always root for you guys when I see him in the entries. Last year, last summer, he won the Harvey Pack Stakes up at Saratoga. Had a couple other nice runs that that summer and that spring uh, i don't know if you were you were friendly with harvey but obviously he was a legend in new york racing you know what did it mean for you guys to win that race with thin white duke well i mean i it was not only friendly with harvey i mean he was really one of my first friends and and mentors around the racetrack uh and we did a lot of tv shows together uh and uh he you know he was a big part of my uh, my life my early career so, you know, the serendipity that that first time they finally belatedly name uh, a stakes for Harvey, uh, you know, for me to be part of the, the group that wins the first running of the Harvey pack. I mean, that that was pretty corny storybook stuff. Oh, man, I loved it. How is how is the Duke doing? Is he pointing towards another campaign? Yeah, he's uh, he's doing great. Uh, our, our horses, uh, which at the moment are all grass horses, got the winner off. Uh, spend it in Saratoga and they're now back with Dave Dock at Belmont. And, you know, as soon as they start grass racing, uh, we'll, we'll be in the entries. Our big goal with, uh, with Duke, uh, at least the first half of the year, uh, is the Jiper, uh, which is going to be run at Saratoga this year, which works out very well for us because then White Duke's favorite racetrack and distance is five and a half at Saratoga. And that's what yep. the Jiper is going to be this year. So uh, we're uh, we're just looking to get them to that in good shape. Right. That's great. That's great. Stephen, last question from from me it has to do with the Kentucky Derby uh, group of this year. Are there one or two candidates that you think uh, have the best chance to win? Because it seems like it's still a pretty, pretty muddied uh, picture right now. Yeah, you know, one one of the nice things about being retired is that I don't have to have opinions about the Derby six, eight, <laughs> ten, twelve weeks out. Right. Um, yes, you, which, you know, I I understand that that working journalists need to have. I really don't. Uh, you know, I I like in retirement sort of seriously looking at the Derby the first time about four or five days before the race, and we'll see what gets. Seems to me there's a, you know, a bunch of nice horses out there. I, I watch the preps as they're run, but uh, no, I don't, I don't have to try to look smart about who's going to win the Derby this year anymore. <laughs> and John, we got to try to look smart for another two months now about That's the Derby that. horses. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I meant it. You're a hero of mine. Obviously, your work at the at the racing forum and your seminal works, your books on playing the horses. I don't I don't think I would be where I am today without you and your insight. So appreciate you coming on the show, spending some time with us. Well, thanks. Thanks for those kind words. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad to see you guys doing a show geared towards the player. And we need more of that. Yep. We'll try to carry that torch, man. Thank you, Steve. Rail Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. We got the Facing Tipton March digital sale coming up this week. Runs March 7th through the 12th. You can check out more information and view the catalog at digital.facingtipton.com. Those sales just keep exploding in popularity. So get involved now while you can still find some deals and find some nice horses that you can turn around quickly and put on the racetrack. You know, John Green's experienced that from both sides before. And then we got the April digital sale coming up April 4th through the 9th and the May digital sale, May 9th through the 14th. You can still nominate for both of those sales and then the next physical sale will be the marquee mid-atlantic two-year-olds in training what we call the crab cake sale at west point in timonium the following the following monday and tuesday after this year's preakness may 20th and the 21st the under tax show is may 14th through the 16th so looking forward to that looking forward to seeing all those babies race on that dirt track and uh, lots of lots of great horses have come out of that sale over the years including john's bestie gamine so one that's a that's a marquee place to go to get one of your superstar superstar two-year-olds but plenty of other horses who can still make you money and still give you lots of action on the track to be had in those digital sales in the meantime and now joe not there's not one not two but three graduates of the digital sales that have won stakes first time out uh, after being purchased whitwater strand um the uh the hip number one from the last sale of the load them back um uh, uh, dispersal and pounce who was sold uh, out of the last sale and like two weeks later won a stake race this weekend at Gulfstream. So you want instant action? You want instant return on your investment? 
It's these digital sales. So our man, our intrepid special correspondent has emerged from last week's blizzard up there in North Dakota. Skip Anderson, how you feeling, pal? Hey, guys. Uh, glad to be back. It was awful last week. That was unbelievable. That blizzard came out of nowhere. We were we set a 100-year record the day before at 62 degrees. The next day, a blizzard comes in, and it's 34 below zero with the wind chill. It was ugly. That is scary. That ain't right. Not right. That ain't right. Wow. 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 Well, we're- and, and Skip, on a personal note, wasn't it Wynn's birthday last week? It was Wynn's birthday last week, February 25th. Uh, we, we have a we have a three year old now. Wow. wow. Eligible wow. for the Derby. Absolutely. Congratulations, Congratulations buddy. That's, wow. that's great news. Thank you. Thank nice. you. Happy birthday, Win. Uh, Skip is back to play another round of Tackler Trade. Uh, before we get into it, Skip, for the new viewers, why don't you just run down the rules real quick? All right. Sounds good. So Tackler Trade is a fun game we play with John and Joe where we get inside their heads and learn a little bit about these guys. I'm going to flip a coin. The coin toss winner gets to go first. We'll ask that winner a question. They have the opportunity to tackle that question by answering it, or they can trade it to their partner and their partner has to answer it. And then we follow up with a second question that that person has to answer. So it's a, it's a game of strategy. So let's get into this. Let's flip the coin. Who wants to call it today? I think it's Joe's turn. It's my turn. All right, Joe, heads, heads or tails? Heads. It's tails, tails today. So John, you get the first question. Right. So in the spirit of spring coming up here, going into March, if you were given the opportunity to go on a college spring break, where are you going to go? Trade. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, John, John trades it to John, Joe. This is ironic because John looks like he's on spring break right now. Like if you're, <laughs> if you're not watching the video, John is Larry the Lobster levels of red. So I don't. I still, he has, still haven't gotten an answer of, of where he is right now. I'm going to say Miami. Miami is like my favorite, my, my favorite like party city that there is. Uh, I love the nightlife. I love the beaches. Obviously, uh, yeah. This spring, it's not. A million degrees quite yet. So, yeah, we'll we'll go with uh, the bright lights of Miami. All right. Sounds good. All right, jo- uh, John, here's your question. So let's keep with the college theme a little bit. So besides horse racing, give us three topics that you could give a one hour lecture on to a college class without preparing for. <laughs> oh, that's that's easy. That's easy. easy. <laughs> All right, let's hear them. Uh, because pr- Skip, as, as, as our audience well knows, I can talk about pretty much freaking anything for an hour, even if it's not necessarily true. I could just, you know, continue to blather on and make up bullshit. As a matter of fact, I'm doing it right now while I'm thinking about the three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I would have to say the I would talk about um, what goes on to produce a podcast, what goes into it. What, uh, you know, factors you have to have in place, who you have to have, um, how you present it, how you promote it. And that's still a work in progress, obviously, for us. Um, I would have to say the second thing would be the the Zen like qualities of scuba diving. I'm a big believer in, wow. in you know, I'm a Patty certified scuba diver for those of you that don't know. And I, you know, my Zen place is to throw a tank on my back and go down, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet in the, into the ocean and just swim around, just watch the fish go by as I'm kind of weightless and, and, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, at all the little critters that are, that are down there. It, it definitely, it lowers my, my pulse rate. Absolutely. Um, and the third thing that I can talk about in great length for at least an hour, because I do for 50 minutes every week with my therapist, is how to be the son of an entrepreneur. Because God knows it is not an easy thing to have to fill the shoes of a great entrepreneur like my father. But, uh, you know, every every week, you know, we try to strive forward and, and continue to do that. So I would have to say that all three of those I am pretty fluent in um, and, and, and would feel very confident in being able to talk for an hour about uh, John, excuse me. Uh, Skip didn't say the answer had to be in an hour. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I can do this for an hour. Exactly. <laughs> he's, fil- he's filibustering. Thank you. Filibustering. Uh, I'm just. I'm. I'm amazed to learn that John is a scuba diver. Like I, what? How long have we known each other? And this has never come up 
throughout our entire relationship. Yeah. I well, when would we ever talk about scuba diving on on a on a racing <laughs> podcast? It just doesn't it doesn't necessarily. I think it's your sense. happy place. I thought I would know where your happy place is. That that All is right, happy, that, that and and your apartment in Brooklyn are my two zen places. <laughs> yeah, you survived, scuba diving right? did not see that one coming so no, there we go we look how much we're learning about people this is awesome right yep all right joe you get to answer this question this weekend is daylight savings time do you think we should keep with daylight savings times and the time change or should we stay on the same time all the time See, that's a tough one. I, I, I lean towards the latter because it's such a bummer in the winter. It is such a bummer when it suddenly starts going, sun starts going down suddenly at 430. But I love this Saturday. I love this part of it where now you're in spring, you know, one day. And now it's, it's basically spring. I say stick with it. I know it's old fashioned. I know it's anachronistic, but you know, who, 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 doesn't, who doesn't like a little switch up every once in a while? The, the clock gets boring doing the same thing all the time. So, yeah, keep it. All right. I can go with that. I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and Skip, Skip, like you are a farmer, like you're the guy that this kind of thing was originally created for. Like you tell me. I don't know. Sometimes in in agriculture, whether you're lambing ewes or foaling mares or whatever the case may be, dark, light, doesn't matter. It's a 24 hour, seven day a week job. So I don't know. I just like it when... uh, there's uh, a lot more daylight at the end of the day rather than right. starting out and getting it dark so early. Got it. John. All right, John, here's your question. Going to get a little fun with this one. Play a little game of would you rather. Would you rather wear somebody's dirty underwear or use somebody's toothbrush, somebody else's toothbrush? Trade? <laughs> no, 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 no. We passed that point. Uh, it's time. Why, why would I ever do I'd rather go commando or have bad breath. That, that's my answer. I'm not going with either one of them. Well, oh, man. That's, that's a tough one, Skip. Uh, no, we, we, had to get, we had to get to a juicy one here. <laughs> juicy right. is the wrong word. Yeah, you don't want to say juicy on either end. Not on either end of that, of that question. So, on that note, John passing on the question defeating the purpose of the entire game uh we'll wrap up this week's tackler trade and we knew like we learned something new about each other that's what this game is for skip thanks for popping back on glad you're safe and not covered in snow tell the people how they can submit questions for tackler trade yeah definitely if you want to get inside the heads of john and joe send me a dm at baba acres with a question that you'd like to hear us ask john and joe on the next installment of tackle or trade All right, so that's going to do it for episode 32 of Rail Talk. Thank you to John Green for joining us from some undisclosed location. Looking sunburnt. I'll I'll see you in Ocala, I hope, buddy, real soon. Uh, Thank you to Steve Crist for coming by. Really happy that Steve Crist is having a a lot of fun in retirement, owning horses, misses riding, but uh, he'll he'll pop up every once in a while to advocate for the horse players. So shout out to Steve for coming through. Thanks to our producer, Patty Wolf. Thanks to our associate producers, Anthony LaRocca, Aaliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson, and Julia Agresta. Appreciate the sponsors as well. Thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week back here on Rail Talk.